Code 72, data search. Classified, eyes only. Subject, enemy possession of suspect weapon 100123. Confirmed. A special agent has been assigned to face the challenge. Was he chosen for his resourcefulness, his ability to perform under pressure, his track record? No, he was available. Hey, your boot's ringing. Oh, is that my boot? I thought it was yours. I think I'll take it outside. It's Maxwell Smart. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Celluloid Zeros podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Carlin, and along for the ride is your other co-host, Jim Carlin. Say hi, brother Jimmy. Hello, everybody. It's uh, episode 11, Mike. Yeah. Episode 11. We're back. I'll remind you that uh, Jim and I saw a lot of movies as kids, and we are cursed with remembering some of them, just like the one that we're reviewing today. On Celluloid Zeros, we take a deep dive into a movie from our childhood that we liked back in the day. But through the lens of our adult eyes, we realize it's pretty freaking terrible. Uh, Today's film, Jim, would you like to introduce today's film to us? Today's film is entitled The Return of Maxwell Smart and specifically The Nude Bomb. I I have to pause there, Jim, because, you know, the, The Return of Maxwell Smart was the name for the movie when they released it on TV. Mm. However, the theatrical release was actually entitled the nude bomb, <laughs> which is funny because there is zero frontal nudity in this movie. And, you know, that's why I'm, I'm sure many people uh, decided to try and see this. You know, it's the 80s. You know, you, know, you want to see a little uh, you want a cheap thrill. Uh, viewers would have been disappointed if that was the case, because zero frontal nudity in this. Um, there was a, uh, you know, a couple of scenes where where things were cleverly hidden. Um, we'll talk about that in a little well, bit. Mike, Mike, there may have been an absence of, of frontal nudity, but I think the bomb moniker is probably pretty accurate. Well, the bomb, you know, if a movie has the word bomb in the title, there's probably a good chance that it could be a bomb itself. I mean, this was this was a uh, this was a bomb. We we did. I mean, in fairness, we did like this movie as kids. But actually, before we before we get into uh, the movie, now this movie came out in 1980s. I just wanted to just talk about the 80s and and just because I think it's important that we put these movies in context, you know, the context of where you know where, where we were in our lives and, and kind of what's going on in culture in the 80s. Now, you and I would have been probably six six years old, five or six, depending on. I think this movie came out in April, so you know, chances are we were five. Um, yeah. we were born in August, so we're five years old. You know, our frame of reference for movies during this time, you know, we've got Airplane, certainly. I think we, we had um, uh, your dog uh, wanting to chime in, apparently. We, we've got we've got some gusty winds outside, um, and I, I wish they would have knocked the cable out last night when I was watching this thing, but sadly they didn't. Uh, so she just responds to the exterior noise. Sorry. So we've got, um, you know, we've got a frame of reference, you know, comedies coming out during this time. We have Raiders of the Lost Ark was, was a movie that came out, I believe, during the same year. Uh, I think Empire Strikes Back came came out. So we had seen a couple of movies and, and now we're sitting um, sort of as five year olds <laughs> about to watch a movie called The Nude Bomb. Now, how mom and dad let us see this movie, I'm not sure. Uh, we probably saw it if memory serves with the Turco family. And I'm sure we've mentioned the Turcos before. We used to see a lot of movies with them. Uh, Guy was, you know, unbeknownst to us at the time, kind of like a low level gangster, high level car not con artist yeah yeah he was mobbed up or some capacity there right was some, there was well, there was something going on there well you know, you're still buddies with with the kids right i mean i know um i know one i won't mention the name but i know uh one of them through through the industry kind of work in the same industry got it got it we, okay. we did yeah uh, we shared a client in common didn't follow in dad's footsteps thankfully no um, no and he i think he fully admitted i think he even said to me once he's like yeah i think my my dad was kind of a jerk <laughs> Those would be concrete footsteps, I guess. <laughs> but Jesus. what I remember about this movie was sitting in the movie theater and one of the, the coming attractions was for The Shining, and oh. which also came out in 1980. And I remember being like scared shitless. Like I wanted to run out of the movie theater because I was that, so scared to death. Just just that oh. attraction for The Shining was, was, you know, scary. That movie still oh. freaks me out to this day. Don't like it at all don't like it well i I will say the book is better um (laughs) but uh still i mean that that actually put me off from actually wanting to go to the movies as a kid i'm like 
I, I would like, I remember mom like took us to the movies once and, and I, I remember like asking her to call the movie theater to make sure that the coming attraction for The Shining wouldn't be played. Um, Mike, as terrifying as The Shining is, um, I mean, would you let that Stephen King near a school? Let him like poke around the playground a little bit? No? Uh, you know, n- having never met him. Oh. Uh, but back in those days, he was pretty hopped up on, um, let's say, pharmaceuticals, which were hard as nails to the cuticles. Right. <laughs> Very All good. All to do is read, read the end of It, where there's basically a gangbang of a 13-year-old. Um, you know, so people yeah. lose their innocence and the clown goes away. You know, oh, uh, God. I mean, spoiler alert, that's kind of what happened to the kids. And uh, and it, that did not make it to the uh, to the to the reboot. Um, no, it's the cutting room floor, so to speak. But I'm pretty Jesus. sure he was on a four day coke bender. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Stephen. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, love, love, love Stephen King's writing. Um, but yeah, no, he's yeah, a little, little creepy. But um, hey, we're all a little bit creepy. I'll tell you what's creepy. Um, why we like this movie so much as kids. Yeah, I, listen, um, you want me to just give like a, a two minute synopsis? Because I, you yeah, know, I think I, it'd be great. All right. So th- this this effectively is a James Bond spoof. I mean, it it it, it uh, Maxwell Smart was a fictional character originally came out a uh, television show of, of, of that title in the 60s and probably had like a four or five year run on TV. Mike, I don't really remember, but it was a, it was a comedy spoof on the kind of James Bond secret agent story. And, and, Don and, and if you remember, Mel Brooks was behind it. I mean, he was the one of the co-creators of this. I, and, I don't have any trouble believing that. I, I didn't know that, but I have no trouble believing that. You would have trouble believing he had anything to do with the movie, which he did not. Yeah. Oh, OK. OK. So the TV show was Brooks. The movie was. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he distanced himself from it. But I mean, essentially, Don Adams is the actor. Um, probably when this movie came out in 1980, he must have been in his late 50s. Uh, you know, he's born in 19 in the 1920s. So he's, he's a decade older, actually, than dad. And, and Don Adams is since deceased. But um, yeah, he plays Agent 86. Uh, they all have numbers. So Agent 86, Agent 22, whoever the guy is that, that's in the desk drawers and, and then the toilets. <laughs> I don't know. But essentially, they, they, they are a government. They're government agents. I mean, we were led to believe, you know, CIA or some sort of clandestine service. And the, the branch chief is, is played in this movie by a guy named Dana Elkar. And essentially, the movie centers around Agent 86 and his quest to stop the maniacal plot of an organization called Chaos, which for anyone familiar with the James Bond films, Chaos is essentially a specter-like organization. Now, and did Chaos stand for anything or was it just... I, I don't know. That's a good question. Was it an acronym for something? It might have been. I, I don't remember. All I know is the head of Chaos was a guy who was dressed head to toe in pantyhose and he had Mike, did he have thimbles on his he had, fingers? He had sewing thimbles on his fingers. I, we're led to believe he was obsessed with, with clothing and fashion because his whole plot for the movie was to detonate a, a, a weapon called a nude bomb, which would effectively remove all the clothing from people, may, maybe all the textiles from the planet, and everybody would be beholden to him for their clothing unless the world paid him something like $5 billion a month, which, you know, in 1980s money was, that was real money back then, 5 billion. Now it's like a tick on the debt clock. Right. But back then he's 5 billion was real money. He's a maniacal, like Tommy Hilfiger trying to get everybody to wear (laughs) his clothing designs. Basically that's what it's all about. Yeah. It just, it's bizarre. And, and, and in order to accomplish his plan, obviously he has the new bomb. But he also creates uh, cloning technology. Why does he create cloning technology? Because how are you going to clothe five billion people? You're going to clothe five billion people by cl- but you're going to clothe five billion people with your outfits by by cloning a, a world famous like seamstress. <laughs> that that's the plan. Don't don't create a machine, Mike, like an assembly line machine. Or, or, or a robot machine that can create billions of articles of clothing, actually actually clone a, a famous Italian, perhaps, seamstress. 
This, I mean, boy, I, to say this plot held together by a thread, like, I don't know, maybe that's generous. But anyway, so Maxwell Smart has to overcome all kinds of obstacles, you know, the all kinds of issues and challenges. He's got somebody working inside his organization who's feeding information to chaos and sabotaging his efforts to get to the bottom of the plot. Eventually, what does he do? He's able to locate the secret headquarters of chaos, which is located on an island. Um, the entryway to the headquarters is actually a zipper. Yes, it like, is. Like you're unzipping a, a gentleman's trousers, a zipper. They, they penetrate, quote unquote, the mountain lair. Um, they get into a big fight with with the head of chaos and his uh, and his cloned, uh, you know, counterparts. And uh, and eventually they succeed and they stop the nude bomb from detonating, except I think it goes off once at the end. And Agent 86 and Dana Elkar and, and the other Agent 22 are running down the road naked. Yeah, that's that's the movie. Um, I, now, I don't know if now, I did it justice. Now, I, I, think I think I did. Um... I think what we should have done was was given everyone a spoiler alert there because mm. gosh, I mean, for all the people who are just going to run out and see this movie, uh, you know, sorry, they, they should have been warned, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's a couple of gags in here that I think are worth kind of you know pointing out. Um, I mean, you mentioned you know you guys wearing pantyhose over his head and thimbles on his fingers. I, yeah. To me, that was <laughs> it's kind of funny, and I always wondered. I mean, did he use those pantyhose? Remember the ones that came in an egg? It, yes. Those, yes. Were, were they control top? I mean, I don't know. But... And he had that like yamaka like thing on his head, and and I just realized after kind of rewatching this, it's to, to it's to hide the seam. You know, I'm yeah. sure it's to hide the seam. Yeah. The thimbles on the fingers. Yeah. I mean, our our grandmother was a seamstress. We knew what thimbles were, but <laughs> you know, it was a little weird, Mike. I you know, it's. It, it's 1980, right? So the, the world is, is a little different. I mean, you know what's weird about it? Because I know we've talked about movies from this, this time period before. I mean, it's basically been the whole podcast. But even though it was an earlier time when in some ways we were like a little more buttoned up, we were a little bit more restrained in certain respects. You know, we had manners. We went to church. We were respectful of elders a little bit more than we are now, like all that stuff. But on the other hand, like there was a sense of irreverence. I mean, certainly in Hollywood, certainly in movies, uh, and and there was there was a, a a dearth of taboos. I mean, this is a guy who's basically dressing in like female pantyhose, you know. And I'm not suggesting that's like cross dressing or being feminine, but I mean, I don't know. It it's a little bit of a third rail these days. Like you're not going to make a movie spoofing somebody wearing you know female like garments uh anymore and um you know so it just i don't know uh it, it's just it, it's a weird it was it was a very weird world back then but on the other hand like if you fast forwarded 40 years and and the people back then looked at what the heck's going on nowadays i mean they'd probably be running back to 1980 naked down the road <laughs> get me back to 1980 please Please, you know, and I, you know, one thing that I love about this is, and I think this was a running gag in, in the original Get Smart series was, was the shoe phone. Uh, back, <laughs> you know, right. back in 1980, and certainly when Get Smart was, was on, I think it was in the 60s, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have a, a dream of, of cell phones or smartphones, you know, so yeah. the idea of concealing a phone in someone's shoe, I mean, it's kind of cool, kind of fun. It was kind of funny. Now they, they kind of uh, evolved that. Uh, in this movie to also have a stapler phone. Uh, so you can stapler. That's yeah, remember what he says. He <laughs> says to Carruthers, he says, well, does it, does it function as a stapler? And he says, no. <laughs> so indignantly, okay. He indignantly says no. And, yes, and smart's like, well, you better, you better work on it. <laughs> a terrible Don Adams impersonation. Of course. Oh God. Uh, you know, goes on, um, you know, in 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 years after this to, to be the voice of Inspector Gadget. On, oh, that's that's a good point. He remember. was Inspector Gadget, Don Adams. Absolutely. Go, go, Gadget skates. Yeah. Someone should have like, go, go, Gadget time machine. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Man. Not green light this movie. But, yeah. But yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, any 
Hey, well, you 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 lead, Mike, because no, I'll, no, I'll no. Get... Um, you know, it was just there were there were certain gags in it that I think, you know, from the eyes of kids, we we thought were kind of cool, like the idea of a, of a driving desk. You know, the desk yes, yes, driving out of the office. Of course, it runs on ink from Saudi Arabia. Oh, well, that was the Mike. <laughs> that was a great line because he said, "My God, you've solved the." the energy crisis, right? Because yeah. remember when the movie's being made, yeah. like people are waiting in line at gas stations for, for hours just to try to get a drop of gas because Saudi Arabia is cutting off the oil supply. So this movie's taking a jab at the Saudi Arabians. Any movies out there taking a jab at Saudi Arabians now? Is no. anyone jabbing at them? Like maybe if Tom Cruise is swinging on a building, you know, beating up some Arab guys or whatever, maybe um, he can get away with that because he's so weird, even though his movies are fantastic. But you know, nobody, nobody's poking at the Saudi Arabians, but back then, oh my God! I mean, oh, well, yeah, I mean, if if you, I remember, like growing up the, during this period of time, our, our mailman was was on a bicycle. Like they had to, <laughs> yeah. The U.S. Post Service was not letting them use, uh, you know, the, the mail vans. Um, yeah, so they, yeah. Could, so they could conserve gas. Um, uh, good right, point. No, no jabs at uh, at the Saudis now. Um, no no jabs at the Chinese now either, uh, because right. they, they own so much of. Hollywood, if I remember correctly, and, and you keep me honest on this one, Jim, when they remade Red Dawn, okay. originally, um, obviously, they, they went away from the Russia storyline. Originally, it was going to be China that invades the U.S. However, um, the Chinese had just purchased a big stake. I think it was in Sony Studios, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, uh, yeah. I could be wrong. Um, so they had to re redo it to, the, I think, the North Koreans. Um, not that I saw the remake of Red Dawn, because, I mean, why... You know, the Red Dawn will never be on this podcast because it's such a great movie. Yeah, I don't know about the second one. I never saw the second one, it, but it, I, it does. It doesn't surprise me that they sanitized it. Although, you know, one could use the word sanitized uh, with with the Chinese because the whole freaking country is such a disaster. I mean, you know, they're chopping off the heads of bats, Mike. Isn't that what they're doing? And 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 spreading viruses all over the place or creating I, I them in labs. I think that's Ozzy Osbourne. I think he was <laughs> no, but I mean the wet markets. I go, it's so disgusting. <laughs> punch is punch. Like it's just. I mean, I God bless. I, I'm there's probably there's billions of Chinese that are living under that crazy regime that wishes they could get the hell out of there. You know, like that wackadoo next door in in North Korea. God bless those people living in those conditions. But no, well, the government is just a bunch of fucking lo- excuse me, a bunch of loonies. Well. You know, I, I don't know how we got to the Chinese. So, uh, well, sorry, I don't know. But no, that, that's OK. Um, you know, but nothing was off limits is the point. Like, get smart. You know, it it, it was unabashedly a spoof, of course. Um, but, you know, you had like you have a bunch of like attractive women in the movie, like Charlie's Angels running around. So Don Adams talking to them, you know, in, in I mean, kind of a condescending manner. Does he say? At one point, like this always happens, you know, it's no business. We're not doing this until after, after 22, after, right? I mean, he's, you know, he's a little bit pretentious in a sense. He's a little bit comical. Uh, he's kind of a bumbler, somewhat of a, but he is somewhat of a bumbler. There's no doubt. But, you know, he's got, he does get the job done, though. I mean, that's kind of the, the endearing thing about the character. Like he's, he's a dunce, but, you know, he is a man and he's got to do what he's got to do. Uh, and he's brave, if not, you know, all that bright sometimes. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, he's not uh, not your classic hero. Uh, <laughs> right. Does go on a hero's journey. Um, but um, and he gets, you know, he, he does wind up getting the, the bad guy in the end. But I mean, are, are we really all that scared about a nude bomb? You know, like, I mean, again, we're in the Cold War, 1980. We're worried right. about the real bomb, right? Right, are, right. Are, are we worried about a nude bomb so much? I mean, does anyone care? Yeah, I guess it was kind of, um, um, it was metaphorical in that sense. I mean, maybe, um, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. Maybe it's a political commentary. Maybe, may, maybe we were so spun up over the war with the Soviet Union, like the Cold War was kind of predicated on the notion that, it would never escalate to a hot war because if it ever did, we'd all be vaporized, right? That was the whole point. So the government we just grew and grew and grew. We landed guys on the moon to outdo Russia. We did all that stuff. And we basically spent the Soviet Union into oblivion. And I guess that was because the Chinese decided to, you know, throw their chips on the American side of the poker table instead of the, instead of the Russian side, maybe. I don't know. But um, 
you know, may, maybe it was a political commentary. Like, you know, we're, we're it's just farcical, like this whole notion of like a, a nuclear bomb being a reason why we have to build up the military industrial complex uh, is is no bigger threat to us, perhaps, than the nude bomb. It's all a joke. Are you suggesting that, you know, you know, that movie that just came out? I think it's on Netflix. Don't look up, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With really, DiCaprio. Yeah. It's really not about a meteor. It's really about global warming. It is. Yeah. That, that the nude bomb is is about really like a metaphor of, of, for the Cold War. Look, I, for all I know, everybody involved in the Don't Look Up picture, which has gotten a lot of positive reviews, actually. It's probably going to win something. I watched it. Meryl Streep is good. Um, for all I know, the people that were involved in that movie, not, not necessarily the actors, but the, the team behind it, most of them probably weren't even alive in 1980. So, um, but all, all I'm, so I, no, I don't necessarily think I can make that connection or, or make that argument convincingly, but I don't know. I mean, you know, movies have often been a, a, a way through the guise of like entertainment and selling seats in the box office to to send messages, to make a social commentary, you know, and I, I don't I don't know that this movie was necessarily spoofing or 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 somehow commentating on the arms race between the Soviets and and us. I, I don't know that for a fact. I just speculating but it wouldn't be the first time that film has been used in that way to send a message that's all i'm saying what was the, the um you know salvatore sebastiani right he, our, our lead bad guy was Dino, he, yeah dino yeah was he italian i mean i couldn't i mean it's, the, the name was italian i i don't think the accent was quite <laughs> no the accent wasn't italian. croatian with <laughs> the and remember like all the other names mike wasn't like Leibowitz and Carruthers and, you know, Chief. Like, they're just all, you know, there's all Don Adams stuff, right? And then, of course, you got to make the evil guy with some sort of a foreign name, right? <laughs> You're going to single out the foreigner. Right? That's who we're going to we're gonna ascribe the evil to, the guy with the, the vowels in his name. I mean, it's classic, <laughs> irreverent, politically incorrect, 100%. I mean, come on. So I don't know what Sebastiani's background was. I didn't remember that he was, again, we're going to spoil the movie for, for folks. Yeah. I didn't remember he was a clone. Yeah. I mean, he's at war with himself. I mean, really, I mean, he's fighting his, his other self. It's like uh, he splits into two. One part of him gets blown up in a lab and loses his hand and, and has a limp. And, and, you know, he's got to chase Maxwell smart through universal studios. <laughs> But the other one is just sitting behind a desk with, with pantyhose. I just, I don't know what's like. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, yes, I think he was Italian, but, but yeah, with, gonna, with an odd accent. Yeah, I'm going to go with Italian, but the, the accent was definitely not Italian. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no yeah. Italian I'd ever heard of. Uh, <laughs> I want to take a moment and just talk about the cones of silence for a second. Sure. Uh, because yeah. that is just a, that is a great, I think that's a great gag. Um, you know, the zipper, you know, entrance into the lair, I mean, completely impractical. Why would you, why would you, I mean, you're basically got to blast so much stone just to make it as, I mean, that's kind of impractical, but cones of silence. I mean, there's a little bit of merit to that, especially like living in a world where like, you know, Google and Alexa, they're all listening to us all the time. And then they overhear us. And we've got, we've got ads that show up. Um, would you want a cone of silence? I mean, is, is, is there any practical application for, for, for a cone of silence? Because. Interesting. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the practical, the practicality of them didn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Technically. I mean, the cone comes down and then it rests on top of the table. So you got this whole open space beneath you where sound waves can clearly travel. I mean, I don't know why all of a sudden silenced everybody's weird. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, it's it's privacy right i mean it's it's kind of um again it's a little bit ironic like those cones come down and you can't hear each other talk i guess the 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 relevance of the cone of silence was like if you were on a telephone call and you didn't want anyone to hear what you were talking about it would kind of muffle the sound so nobody could eavesdrop on your conversation i guess um but, you know, it's kind of funny, like these days, technology allows us to spy on everybody. I mean, you know, like Bush, Bush had every, we were listening to every conversation. Right. I mean, didn't we do that? Didn't, didn't the, the, the defense intelligence agency or whoever was running that thing has the supercomputer who's listening to this podcast, listening to everybody's telephone calls. 
And the idea is that, you know, you got guys with the backpack and the nails and they're going to run into a disco in the city and blow everybody up. So we got to listen to everybody's phone call. Yeah. I mean, but, but, you know, the, the cones of silence come down. You can't even hear what anyone else is saying. It's, it's no, like, I don't I really it's a funny concept, <laughs> but you're basically, what are you, you're miming at that point. Right. <laughs> it was so I mean, it all, they all came down and they couldn't talk to each other. So finally they lifted them up. I mean, it just, it didn't, it didn't really make a heck of a lot of sense. A lot, nothing made sense. Like the beginning of the movie, he's jumping out of a plane in a parachute. Okay. And he loses his parachute. So he says to like the chief or whoever he's talking to, I'll be down, I'll be landing in about two minutes. And then he can't pull his parachute because the backpack rips off or whatever. And he says, actually, would you believe I'll be down in like 20 seconds or whatever? So we don't actually know how Maxwell Smart survives a free fall from an airplane at that no. point. I mean, no. he does, but we have no idea. And he's like super Dave Osborne at that point. You know? Right, Not right. Just a soul. Um, I mean, anything, anything, I mean, could 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 or should this movie be remade? I mean, if, if they could remake it with this concept of an inept spy, and I guess you kind of have it with Austin Powers a little bit, right? Where he's a bit inept, I mean, but, you know, a little Rico Suave. I mean, d- does the concept of an inept spy comedy, you know, based off of James Bond, does it have any kind of merit? Well, I'm going to tell you this and you're going to you're going to say, oh, my God, that's right. They, they did make a modern day iteration of this movie with Steve Carell. I think Carell played Maxwell true. Smart. That's true. Um, yeah, that I movie did very well. That would not be considered a zero. Yeah. Well, that, isn't that ironic, though? Like they were able to I don't I never saw it. I never saw it. So I don't know how, um, you know, how true that movie was to the original. I mean, Carell is a very funny guy. I mean, I, I can't get The Office out of my head. I mean, I just think that show, I mean, I don't know. The Office could be one of the funniest programs in the history of, of TV. I mean, I know that's a lot of people feel that way. I, I certainly do. But um, I, I don't remember how the Carell Maxwell Smart came about. I just, you know, it, it's funny because as bumbling as he was in this movie, he still had a little bit of swagger to him, didn't he? Like he still... 22 still wanted Maxwell Smart. Um, Maxwell Smart was still able to impress the ladies. Um, in fact, they were almost endeared by his mannerisms and his behavior and the things that he said. Um, and I know we've talked about this topic before, and I, I you know, I don't want to go off on a on a tangent with it, but you know, like uh, look at how. Every guy seems to be portrayed as a bumbling fool now, like from every commercial you watch to, you know, who they are on a television show. And they're always making mistakes and they can never figure anything out. And they're just a bunch of dumb oafs. Right. I mean, they've, you've gone from like Gordon Gecko taking over the world and smacking everybody around with his bravado to like these little like, bravado. bravado to these little nymphsy nymphs, you know. That's that's all. And, uh, you know, again, and I guess maybe enough said, but I I appreciated that aspect of it, that even through his ineptitude, um, he wasn't just he wasn't just made fun of because he was a dope. He he there were elements to him that were brave. They were, you know, persistent, determined. I mean, you know, as stupid as he was, sometimes maybe he didn't even know he was in trouble. But Maxwell Smart was brave, you know. I mean, he had to he had to do what he had to do. Um, so I guess that that was laudable. He kept his focus. He didn't get. I mean, look, James Bond will always find time to you know rip somebody's dress off and take care of take care of that situation while the world is burning. But but eventually he he gets back on track. But Maxwell Smart, you know, he he kept his focus on on protecting us from nudity. <laughs> and, that, and that's laudable, Mike. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's a uh, maybe it's a whole, uh, you know, conversation or a whole, you know, um, you know, uh, point of view on on uh, on nudity um, and, and why we should be ashamed of our bodies. I, I, I don't know. I just don't. I mean, I, if you're in the writer's room, right, <laughs> like and you're trying to think of. Yeah, that's right, Sadie. Um, but if you're trying to think of like, okay, well, what what's what's this bad guy with the pantyhose uh, over his head and the thimbles? What's he going to be holding over us 
so that we're, wow. we're, we're scared, you know, we're scared in action. We're going to pay his 5 billion a month and we're going to buy his clothes. And, and you're thinking, well, he's going to have this bomb and it's going to go off and everyone's going to be naked. It's like, okay, well, what else you got? You know, it's like, like, how do you, I, I just, I just don't understand how the con like somebody, somebody's kid must have come up with this concept, you know, some executives kid. Um, it's just it, to me, you know, the gags are funny, you know, you get some good one liners in there, but just the premise of like uh, the whole MacGuffin trying to, 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 to get a hold of this nude bomb is stupid. Yeah. I mean, I, it's not going to hurt anybody. And you know? I mean, it's going to embarrass a couple of people, maybe give, maybe induce some heart attacks. Right. Uh, listen, maybe, maybe one thing they're able to do in this movie, because, you know, look, you, you look at the guy with his pantyhose on his face and you're like, this is a weird dude. I mean, it's a weird guy. Like I feel really uncomfortable. Well, I go hang around with the North Korean guy. Yeah. What, I don't know. What's his name? Kim, Kim Ilk. Yeah. 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 Bill John, Dennis, whatever. Dennis, Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Dennis Rodman. So, I mean, yeah, look who's hanging out with him. Like Rodman's the only guy. Rodman can go in there and you walk into the, the leader of, of North Korea's office and he's probably got like, like mannequins of like <laughs> things and, and like a life-size Peter Pan doll or something. Right. With little sparklies around the room. I mean, you got to believe Mike that he's a weird dude. Like there's <laughs> something, there's something off oh, he's, about he's, him. He's got a captain hook costume somewhere. A hundred percent. And they keep him locked away. Could they, they let him play with his little space dolls toys, right? His little uh, space balls, action dolls. Remember when Darth Hellman comes in, he's like, did you see me playing with my dolls? And that's probably what they're with Korean dudes. So he's playing with his dolls. Um, so he's he's a whack job. As he's probably no stranger than than the guy wearing pantyhose on his head. And and there's another commentary. Look, you've got you've got real serious problems in this world, and and most of them, you know, are caused by by people who are really really off. They're really odd. I, I think Putin is probably a weirdo too in his own way. Yeah, you know, re wrestling bears and doing judo and what the f I mean. It, it, Trust me, there, there's something there's something that's likely off with him. The guy in in North Korea is is a total loon, okay, and and people suffer as a result because they have the unfortunate, you know, accident of birth of having to be born in these countries and living under these whack jobs, you know. I'll tell I you mean, what, you know, just just to cut you off on this rant because I don't know where it's going. Um, I, I I just had a thought like years ago. Um, I remember like it was like Halloween and, and at the karate studio where our kids um, school, the karate school where our kids cool. took karate. Um, uh, it was it was Halloween and you could you could bring a, they had a little Halloween party. You could dress up. And one of the uh, the senseis dressed up in a morph suit. You know what a morph suit is? I'm afraid I don't. Yeah, it's, it, it, it basically um, it was inspired by and I have to believe it was inspired by Salvatore Sebastiani because it looks like like one whole thing of pantyhose that you're putting over. Um, and I'm thinking like I think this movie could have, you know, inspired the whole morph suit craze of about 10 years ago. What 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 does one do in a morph suit, though? What what is the what what, what is it trying to represent? It's basically a costume, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say, I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Okay, doesn't I'll help, take a look. Doesn't help, doesn't help the listeners. No, um, but if you're watching, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll you'll get it. This is a morph suit right here. Okay. Yep. Right. So yep. this this is Salvatore Sebastiani, is it not? It is. It is. That different is a... different color. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's Salvatore Sebastiani right there. Doesn't look very comfortable. No, no. Almost like a fencing outfit, you know. It kinda. looks like a fencing outfit. Yeah. Exactly yeah. like a fencing outfit. So, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe it was inspired by fencing. Uh, in my mind, <laughs> in my mind, it's inspired by Salvatore Sebastiani. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mike, what about um, the whole run through Universal Studios? I mean, it's interesting. Like, um, it's it's a microcosm of, of like that decade. And the decade, it just really kicked off. and. You had the Battlestar Galactica scene where he's running through 
you know, that part of the Universal Studios and then Jaws. And, you know, it's like they, they just took a bunch of this pop culture stuff at the time, pop culture, and just said, let's just add these references into the movie and maybe make it a little more interesting for a younger audience. Because, I mean, the, the demographic of the characters, I mean, Don Adams, again, at the time was almost 60. Yeah. You know, our, our kids lining up to go see like a 60 year old wacky crime fighter guy or I don't know. I think, I think that whole run through universal was kind of like a, a joke inside of a, a, a comedy. Right. So that you're kind mm. of getting a behind the scenes of, of movie making and, and you get the jaws, you get the tour. Was there a red sea parting there as well? Uh, yeah. They, yeah, they, they dumped off some of the people. Yeah. <laughs> Well, which which did have a little bit of a Mel Brooks kind of like vestiges, you know, maybe yeah. an ode to Brooks because they have to bring that up, you know. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Listen, um, it was a stupid, silly movie. It's really even hard to derive any any virtue. Like, uh, how do you come up with even an argument? This this is a tough one, um, you not, know. But it's not a lot of defense of this one. It is what it is. Um, you know, I'm sure the, the original creators, you know, uh, Mel Brooks and, and Buck Henry, I believe, uh, I believe they're probably, you know, they're, I, Mel Brooks is not in his grave yet, but uh, no, no, I think Mel's still kicking in his nineties. Yeah. Right? yeah. But I, I can't, I can't imagine he's looking back on that movie saying, uh, you know, God, I, I wish I had something to do with it. So no, but a, but a brilliant comedic mastermind that Mel Brooks. And I just wonder like, I, you know, I know we've talked about this before, but guys like that who made their career on just shocking people. You know, I was watching like um, some clips from a Richard Pryor stand up and, and even like an Eddie Murphy stand up from back in the eighties. And I mean, I can't even imagine if, if one of these guys were out there now um, saying the things that they were saying, even about their own, background and their own ethnicity necessarily i don't honestly it used to be like if you were part of a racial minority as an example you you could you could talk about you know issues within that demographic community and spoof it all you wanted and nobody could touch you right because that you were just talking about your own i hate to even say those words but you know your own demographic yeah i don't i don't know how a kevin hart functions now i don't know how um you know some of these other i mean look at what louis ck had to do i know he had his own zipper in the mountain kind of problems right i know louis ck had those problems but but you know he he was an edgy guy before you know what he does now you go to his website and if you want to see a louis ck special you don't subscribe to netflix or or amazon prime or anything you actually buy the performance directly from his website he goes and sells out a venue and he still does sorry everybody he still sells out venues um and you buy that broadcast from his website it, the whole thing's been democratized you want to silence me fine but i'm going to put this on my website and sell it and you know what millions of people are buying it yeah um so yeah. good for, good he's, for him he's got a he's got a pirate ship now but jim we gotta we gotta bring this one to a close sorry uh, what 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 do you think our next zero should be? I have some thoughts, but I think I picked out this one, so I think you'd be. Able Did to you? Yeah. Oh my gosh, God in heaven. Um, you know, I'm always thinking about trying to do something different. You know, because we've done, you know, we've done the wacky comedy. We started this whole enterprise with the wacky comedy. Um, we've done some dramas. You know, we've done some fantasy. Um. It you know it, it's it's hard. I, I we've done horror like the horror spoof, which was great. Um, you know, and I, I did, to me this episode is a way to kind of get our feet wet again because we you know we've had a quite a break since Action Jackson. Um, I don't know, Mike. I don't have a fresh idea in my head, unfortunately. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out here, and we can of course talk about it. Um, Iron Eagle. <sighs> I don't think we've done an action one in in a while. Um, I do think. Uh, We've never done a military inspired action. No, no, but it is a preposterous plot. Yes, it is. Movie it is. is. Movie we liked back in the day. And it is. And in fact, I, I just saw Jason Gedrick uh in I was I've been catching up on Dexter because they yep. released that new season on Showtime. So before I watched that, I, I gotta 
finish the old series and I'm, I'm just almost done with it. But Gidrick played a role in about four or five episodes of Dexter. So, so I've seen Gidrick, um, had some work done clearly. Um, but the, the real story of Iron Eagle, and it's a great choice, by the way, is just um, probably the, the strangest career in Hollywood and the one that makes me scratch my head more than anything else is the the film career of uh what's his name in iron eagle chappie um oh, no God. lou gossett jr lou gossett jr officer lou, and lou, gentleman lou gossett jr and i believe he won an academy award for officer and a gentleman well deserved by the way great, great performance great movie wonderful actor i have never seen a career it was like one car accident after another. He just kept smashing the car. If his career is a car, there was nothing left of that car by the end of his career. It was over. The only exception, the only quality movie I can remember that he made after Officer and a Gentleman was Digstown. And if you've never seen Digstown, you have to. It, it's it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. He played like a, he's a boxer, and it, it's it's phenomenal. It's a great movie. And James, uh, not James Con, but um, oh Mike, what's his name? Um, he's the guy who had the high school named after him in in, in Family Guy. James Woods. James, James Woods. Woods. Phenomenal movie with uh, James Woods and and Lou Gossett Jr. But I mean, Mike, Lou Gossett's in Firewalker. I mean, you know, some of his move, all of his movies. Was, with he, those, was he an enemy mine? Was he an enemy mine? You know, he might have been. It was Dennis Quaid, and I don't know if that was Lou Gossett who played the the alien in it. I, I cannot remember. Um, but Lou Gossett. Jr. Oh, I, I believe Lou Gossett Jr. was an enemy mine. Was he the enemy mine? He was the enemy down in the mine. Oh yes. Wow. No, he wow. was an enemy mine. He was an enemy mine. Oof. Well. All right. Well, I think we're going to bring this one to a close, James. Well, I appreciate, uh, you know, having this opportunity, Mike. It's a frigid day outside. We had kind of a, I don't know. I don't know. The snowstorm was a little, was it overblown? Um, it's cold out, though. It is cold uh, and windy. Yes, it is cold and windy. But I, I don't think our listeners need need to hear <laughs> the weather in Connecticut. So. <laughs> No, because well, they're all over the world. But uh, but great choice. Looking forward to talking to you about Iron Eagle and, um, you know, all good. Until next time.